Welcome to the forum and thank you for joining us at the latest the Esquire Modern Employer Seminar. Um, lots of familiar faces um, from previous seminars that we've run in this series, but we have some, I think, new faces as well. So welcome to you. I'm Dan Chapman. I'm head of the employment team at the Esquire. And I'm one of your speakers this morning, but by some distance not the most important speaker this morning. I'll talk you through the format. Um, we're going to aim to finish um, probably by 9, 10, 9, 15, something like that, at which point you're absolutely free to go. Um, but equally, if you'd like to join us upstairs for some more coffees and food, you're more than welcome. We're going to hang around and um, chat to anybody about anything at all. Um, it's a, a rare opportunity to have access to lawyers free of charge. So <laughs> do not feel afraid to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, tomorrow is April the 1st. In many ways, I wish we were doing the seminar tomorrow. Um, it would fit in well with the Mythbusters topic, and I could have far more fun with you all. Um, but nonetheless, um, tomorrow is an important day because, as I'm sure you know, tomorrow is the beginning of the new era called Living with COVID. Um, for the last 18 months, if not more, as employers, we've been operating under a legal regime which has been called working safely with COVID, but from tomorrow we're going to live with it, um, which is a fundamental shift in positive mindset that we're all terribly excited about, um, particularly as employment lawyers, because um, things are greyer than ever. And we do have a Q&A session um, at, the, at the end this morning, and feel free to ask us questions if you wish about COVID, about anything at all. Um, we'll do our very best to help. So, what are we um, doing this morning? Um, Pete, the clicker is no longer working. It's a slight technical hitch. Okay, let's see if I know how to. Any idea what's happening there? Turn it on, that might help. <laughs> no, how do I do it manually? So, um, the modern employer theme, for those of you that have not been before, is where we as employment lawyers try and cover topics in a way that's very positive, it's very 2022, um, though I still like to throw in some doom and negativity, um, so don't worry, um, but, but the others generally are more <coughs> positive and happy about life than I am, um, so you'll get the benefit of, 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 of that, but, but, but in all seriousness, we try and, and, and approach employment law in a way which is very forward thinking. But particularly today, we're going to be talking about employment law myths. Um, and Harriet and, and James will be coming up here in a moment, um, two lawyers in our employment team, to deal with some of these myths that we get asked an awful lot by clients. Um, and we thought it'd be real, really helpful to just go through some of these and, and dispel them so that you can go back to your workplaces today full of incredible knowledge um, about all of these myths. Um, we always have a guest speaker um, at our seminars from another discipline of law. Um, and this time we have a family lawyer, Ellie Davies, who's going to be coming up and talking to you about some family law myths and why family law, might, might, might you ask. Um, one of the incredibly annoying things about being a lawyer is that you get friends inverted commas friends, people that you haven't spoken to for about 25 years. <laughs> um, they sort of track you down on social media and message you and say, hey Dan, um, can you just um, help me? I've got a parking ticket. <laughs> or, or, or Dan, remember me? You know, I once bought you a drink at the Union Bar and um, I've just been done for speeding. Can you get me off? And it's a bit of a pain because everyone thinks that because you're a lawyer, you know everything about every topic. And the other topic that I always get asked about is family law. People are always asking me, you know, can I get a prenuptial, Dan? Like, can I get a divorce? Is it going to cost me anything? Um, and, and there's all sorts of myths in family law. And I thought it'd be really useful to try and dispel some of those um, today for you. Now, please be clear. I'm not suggesting that you go home tonight and file for divorce yourself <laughs> or get your partner to sign a prenup armed with all this new knowledge. Um, because that would be very aggressive and crass of us. And we're not that sort of firm. 
However, um, <laughs> if you have any friends who <laughs> ask you in future about that sort of thing, feel free to think of Lee Spire and Ellie, and we'd love to help. Uh, I'll do the legal update and any questions at the end. So I'm going to hand you over to Parrot House Senior Associate in our employment team, James Conley, a solicitor, and they're going to talk to you about some employment law myths. Slight technical issues. I'm just going to move back over here because without a clicker, I'd have to do the Chris Whitty, next slide please, next slide please, and I'm not doing that. So I'm just going to head back over here. Right, brilliant. Oh, it's lovely to be standing here again. <laughs> this is the first time I've presented for about three years, wow. and I'm a little bit excited about it. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> um, so Dan's introduced us. I think most of you guys know who I am. Um, some of you might not know James, who is one of the newest members of our team. Um, James and I are going to be busting employment law myths. Um, now, Sarah vetoed our suggestion that we ought to come dressed as the Ghostbusters. I think actually that was quite a sensible overhauling. Um, but yeah, so we're going to be busting some employment law myths. Um, the reality is, is that lots of things around employment law are a little bit confusing, there's a little bit of grey area, um, and we get asked, these next 10 topics we get asked a lot about. Um, so we wanted to go through them with you. Um, but for those of you who have been to these sessions with me presenting before, you'll know that I like a little bit of audience participation. So you will find in your packs a tick and a cross. And for each of these myths, we're going to ask you as the audience to decide whether you think what we're saying is true or false, or it depends. If you think it's true, hold up your tick. If you think it's false, hold up your cross. And if you're not sure and you think it might depend, you can hold up both. Okay? <laughs> Excellent. Right. Um, you'll also find in your packs that whilst we do have a copy of the slides, they are a slimmed down copy of the slides, because we didn't want to give you all of the answers beforehand, because that would be no fun at all. Um, you will be sent an electronic version of the slides after the event, um, and obviously we're saving trees as well at the same time. So, first up, true or false, an employee must sign the employment contract for it to be valid. Good work. Yeah. So. I think it's definitely false. Yeah. Yeah. Good work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you're, most of you, absolutely right. The employee does not need to sign the employment contract for it to be valid. The employee shows up for work, does the job that you've hired them to do, um, comes in on, on the time that you've asked them to, the place that you've asked them to, there is an employment contract and there is arguably deemed acceptance of the terms that you have provided to them. Um, and in fact, even if you don't have a written agreement at all, there is still an employment contract. Um, but remember that, of course, legally, you guys need to be providing certain written terms to your employees and workers on or before day one of employment. So whether it's signed or unsigned, you need to be providing these written terms to your employees. And I've put here on the slides that you'll get after the session some of the things that need to be included in these written terms. And as long as you do that, hand that contract of employment to your employees, you have ticked the box from an employment law perspective. But with our modern employee, <coughs> employer hat on, um, we would always advise that you get a signed contract. Um, the only people who win <coughs> when you haven't got a signed contract are us as your employment lawyers who have to pull apart the disputes that you get into with your employees because if they haven't signed the contract, they say they haven't agreed to certain terms, particularly terms that don't have sort of immediate effect, um, and there can be all sorts of disputes and uncertainty. So our advice is always get a signed contract. Um, and one of the things, one of the top tips is to make sure that for your new starters, you send your, your new employees um, a draft of the contract and you ask them to sign it and bring it in signed on day one of employment. You've got your signed contract. For employees who you're asking to sign new terms, you can sometimes incentivise them to bring in their signed contracts, um, tie it in with the pay rise, say the pay rise doesn't come into effect until they have signed the contract. Um, so that's myth number one. Handing over to James for myth number Thank two. You, 
Yeah, so um, cards at the ready. So employers, uh, sorry, employees with children have the right to work flexibly. What do we think? Mm. Oh, ready to oh, it is, yeah. Red to <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Absolutely. So <laughs> this is false. So there is no automatic right to um, day one flexible working for for anyone, including parents. So um, obviously anyone can make uh, an informal flexible working request. That's just standard. Um, and um, I suppose parents are no different. But we do get this one quite often. Um, I think it might go back to the uh, there was a government consultation last year um, about the day one right to request flexible working but obviously that was for the right to request flexible working being a day one right and it's just it's just nonsense so the law is still the same um, anyone can make an informal application um, but for a formal flexible working application um, an employee or parent all the same you have to have 26 weeks continuous service um, and you can't have applied for the last 12 months um, and as long as you make a valid flexible working request then you guys will have to obviously um, consider it as, as um, is, is fair um, and what we would say I suppose with the modern employer hat on is that you should always consider flexible working requests for, um, for parents um, and, and think about being as reasonable as possible, I suppose, for a couple of reasons. The first being, naturally, you would avoid unnecessary grievances um, and sex discrimination claims, so it's always good to be flexible in that sense. But also, um, as a recruitment tool, um, even though it might be a myth, you know, people want employers to be flexible nowadays. So, um, you know, if you can say to um, new talent coming in uh, that, you know, you're going to accommodate flexibility, you're going to accommodate people with, with children, um, that's a great way of retaining and obtaining talent. So, yes, myth busted. <laughs> myth busted, I like that. Okay, next up. True or false? A sick, pregnant or disabled employee cannot be dismissed. Oh, you guys are good. Okay. Yeah, spot on. False. Well done. Um, now, I have to caveat this part of the session with, as I've said to most of you, and I think most of you know, us as modern employers and these sessions are not sessions on how to fire people or how to fire people and get away with it. Okay? So, but we did want to cover this topic because particularly for employees with less than two years service, this is one we get asked an awful lot about. Um, and it does depend on the length of service, but it is, it is possible to dismiss an employee with, um, who is pregnant or who has a disability. You've just got to make sure that you go through a fair process and make sure that you're not doing it because they're pregnant or because they're disabled, because then you're going to get into all sorts of trouble that we will, of course, try to get you out of, but may not be able to. Um, so for employees with more than two years service, you've got to be remembering that as well as making sure that it's unconnected to pregnancy or disability, you're going through a fair process and you've got one of the fair reasons to dismiss. But focusing on employees with less than two years service um, and using the example that we probably get asked the most about is employees who are, have got very short service, who aren't performing as you need them to, who have announced that they're pregnant or have told you about a disability, um, people always feel really nervous about taking the steps to terminate that employment relationship that they would ordinarily take without thinking about it for employees who weren't pregnant or who employees who weren't disabled. So it's just about separating out why you are thinking about terminating the employment relationship away from the pregnancy or any disability or any sickness absence, okay? Um, and it is a difficult distinction because very often there can be arguments around the fact that if there's poor performance, is it linked to pregnancy? <coughs> is it linked to disability? If you can separate it out, then you can still go through a fair process and consider dismissing. Um, but again, from a modern employer perspective, we would say in order to do that, you need to make sure that you've got a really good paper trail. 
So if you've got issues with poor performance, make sure that you're documenting them because we will always say to you, particularly for pregnant employees, we will say to you, did you have issues with the performance before pregnancy? And you say, yes, I absolutely did. This is completely unrelated to pregnancy. And we will say, we will ask you for that, for that information. Um, so keep a really good paper trail, make sure that you've got evidence and make sure that you go through a process. Um, I appreciate that with employees less than two years, and we're going to come on to that shortly, um, you might be less inclined to go through a full process. But go through a process, because having those conversations will allow you to firstly weed out any potential allegations that you're, be, you're discriminating, um, and it will also allow you to understand whether or not there is a potential link <coughs> between any poor performance and any disability. And you might be able to make adjustments, you might be able to do things that actually mean that you don't need to end employment after all. Um, and obviously that would be an ideal scenario. And always we would say with this scenario, if you are in doubt, do call us because it is a particularly tricky area for employers to navigate. Okay, back over to Joe. Thank you. So, employers don't need a fair reason to dismiss an employee at the end of their fixed term contract. So, what do you think? Oh, I think this is a tricky one. This is a, this is a, tricky, is a tricky one. It's a real mixed bag. Yeah, okay. mixed bag. So, yeah, I think it is. Okay, well. There we go. I apologise. <laughs> I apologise for the very lawyer scars. It depends, but we really hear that too much. But um, it really does. Um, the question isn't really, is it a fixed term contract? The question is much more, what's the length of service? Um, that that employee has. So rather than ha you know, how long is the fixed term, well it's only six months, if that employee has been working for you for the last six years, you're still going to need a fair pr procedure and to rely on a fair process, uh, and a fair reason, sorry. So um, that's the first thing. Um, and what you need to remember is that by law, a ex the expiration of a fixed term contract counts as dismissal. So you have to be very careful if you haven't gone through that fair procedure um, and you haven't relied on a fair reason and the fixed term contract ends, then you have dismissed the employee and you haven't relied on a fair reason. So you can get caught out. Um, obviously if they've only got you know a year's, a year's service then it's less of a problem but um, what we'd say is at the end of um, any kind of fixed term contract where the employee has two years service, think about um, in advance when it's coming up, what's the reason going to be? Um, they have the right not to be unfairly dismissed, so you need to think, why is the fixed term contract coming to an end? Um, and there's a few different reasons that that could be. So first of all, you might have an apprentice who's been doing a three year fixed term, um, who's got a fixed term contract, and at the end you're not going to take them on. Um, in that sort of circumstances, you'd be relying most likely, I would have thought, on some other substantial reason. Um, if the fixed term contract is to cover um, perhaps a specific client or a piece of work, um, and that client's leaving or you know the, the work's coming to an end, then it would probably be redundancy, um, and that means that you have to go through the same procedure that you would for any other normal employee. Um, so consult with them, explain that the work's coming to an end, have you looked for suitable alternative employment for them, and if there isn't, and they are going to be redundant essentially, then you would need to be making a statutory redundancy payment to them, just like anyone else. Miss busted. Miss busted. <laughs> Okay, this is one of my favourite employment law myths, um, and one that we get all the time at work, and also lots of other people always say, oh, it is not legal to give a bad reference. So I'm hoping that you can know by the tone of my voice what the answer to this is. So true or false, it is illegal to give a bad reference. Well done, there we go. Um, in fact, and I know this isn't very modern employer of me, you can say whatever you like in a reference as long as it's not false, inaccurate or discriminatory. Um, but with our modern employer hats on, and particularly bearing in mind the wonderful thing that is GDPR and a data subject access request, remember that whatever you write in a reference, the person that you are writing about can get to see it. 
Um, so what I always say to people when you're drafting references is, how would you feel if you read that about yourself? And the more negative things that you say, the more likely there's going to be conflict. So with the modern employer hat on, do think about what you're saying. Um, and also be mindful that it's not just the disgruntled former employee who can come after you if, you're, if your reference is inaccurate or is discriminatory. If your reference misrepresents the situation, then the prospective employer can also come after you as well. So, when you're thinking about references, think about how you'd feel if you read it. Think about, have you got the evidence to substantiate what you're saying in the reference? Um, because if you haven't, then that could be an issue if there then becomes a dispute over what's in the reference. Um, and one of the key problem areas that we see here is outstanding disciplinary issues. So employees who are going through a disciplinary process, they resign partway through, you haven't completed the process, they then make a reference request. Do you comment about the disciplinary allegations? Well, if you haven't done an investigation and you haven't put the allegations to the employee, then you can't then say in the reference that employee did X, Y and Z because you haven't gone through that fair process. So just bear in mind, have you got the evidence to back up what you're saying in the reference? Um, I'd also just say as a practical tip, um, in terms of your businesses, make sure that only certain people are allowed and permitted to give references and that those people have training on how to give references. Um, because otherwise you get this inconsistency that can lead to discrimination claims and other issues um, for you and your business. Um, the other thing is just the practical point, have the little disclaimer at the bottom of the reference um, because it will protect you in some ways and in some claims in relation to claims from other employers. So, myth busted. Back busted. over to Jane. Equal pay, here we go. So, <laughs> under equal pay legislation, checkout workers <laughs> must receive the same pay as warehouse workers. What do we think? More of a mixed bag again. We've got some no's, we've got some yeses, we've got some maybes. <laughs> So, it is a mixed bag. So, this is one we hear a lot, but it is false. Um, absolutely false. Absolutely false. Very, very false. And I think we get this a lot following the, um, the presence of a number of news stories that came out over the last year, which dealt with equal pay cases. So, you're forgiven for thinking that it's true, I think. Um, and... They are very headline grabbing. Um, they are, um, it makes it sound like thousands of, of, of checkout workers up and down the country um, are gonna come into some kind of mad windfall payment of thousands of pounds and uh, you know, Morrisons and Tesco's are gonna go bankrupt because of it. Um, but in actual fact, um, that's just not the case. And I know what you're thinking, the media, you know, misportraying something for effect, um, can't believe it, but yes, it's true, <laughs> they have. Um, it's, it's really, those, those cases established a very kind of niche technical point, and what it related to was whether or not shop floor workers could compare themselves to workers in a depot or um, more manual operative workers. Um, and it took seven years to get to um, where we are now, so that's the court system for you, but um, you know, it, it took that long to get here, and it's true, they did win. So they won the right to compare themselves to those depot workers. So um, it is true, it was a big win for thousands of workers. Is it going to drastically change the law? No, absolutely not. The, the, the law is still the same. Um, so it's going back down to first instance cases, so the, the tribunal will now decide the two second parts of the test, which are essentially, um, okay, so you've, you've found a comparator, the depot workers, um, is there a difference in pay, what's the reason, is it an objective reason, um, or is it inherently discriminatory? So there's still a really long way to go, and you know, I, I think it did potentially worry a number of employers when those headlines came out. People started to think, you know, if I've got two workplaces, one perhaps where there's more administrative functions going on, and then another workplace where there's more, you know, manual operatives working, do I now suddenly have to pay them all the same? 
Of course, the answer is no. The law is equal pay for men and women who are doing equal work. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean, though, that everyone has to get paid the same. You can still rely on objective, um, uh, as long as you can ob objectively justify why you're paying people differently, then that's fine. As long as it's not an inherently discriminatory reason, then you can pay them differently. Um, and for example, there are things like different qualification levels. Um, you might have a workforce agreement in place or a collective agreement in place, which is protected pay, for example. Um, those all still count, so it's absolutely fine. You don't need to worry. Um, it's a myth. And it's a myth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, again, this is a, a, another uh, question that we get asked a lot about in terms of when you can and can't suspend an employee. Um, so, true or false, an employer should always suspend an employee who is suspected of gross misconduct. Oh, you guys don't even need to be here, do you? You must have great lawyers, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you're absolutely right, it's false. Um, but we wanted to talk about this one specifically because I think lots of people <coughs> have this sort of tendency to be, become aware of gross misconduct allegations and suddenly think suspension. That is almost a sort of knee-jerk reaction. And in fact, what the courts have said is that suspension should absolutely not be a knee-jerk reaction to allegations of misconduct or gross misconduct. Um, and in fact, the way that we would advise you guys to look at it, particularly from a modern employer perspective, is do you need to suspend? Are the allegations such that you need to suspend? Um, and the types of situations that it might be proper and appropriate to suspend are things like where you want to protect the rest of your workforce. So if there's been allegations of violence or bullying or harassment, um, that may well be a situation where you would consider suspending. Um, do you have concerns that your investigation may be hampered by the employee staying at work? If that is the case, then that may be a situation where you would consider suspension. The other thing to bear in mind when you're thinking about whether to suspend an employee or not is are there any alternatives? Um, and this is again, I think, sometimes something that, that, that people forget. Are there other ways that you can overcome these issues? Could you relocate the employee, separate them out from the person that they're alleged to have victimised, bullied, harassed? Could you, you know, ask them to work from home? Um, have a look at alternatives and make sure that you have given those considerations. Not least because suspension has to be on full pay. So if you send somebody home to sit on their backsides while you do the investigation, you're paying for that time. So if you can keep them in the workplace, then, then, then do think of alternatives. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that if you do decide to suspend, there are lots of things that you need to make sure that you do. The first <coughs> thing is I would always suggest you explain to the employee that they're being suspended and why they are being suspended. You don't need to tell them what the allegations are in full. That is not that stage of the disciplinary process. But practically speaking, and from a modern employer perspective, explain to them what's happened in brief and why they are being suspended. You're much less likely to get pushed back um, to have that conversation. Confirm it in writing, make sure it's paid, make sure it's kept under review. Um, don't just let people on suspension just get you know, off into the distance, forget about them, um, make sure it's for as short as time as possible, you crack on with the disciplinary process. Um, and of course, with my sort of pink and fluffy mental health and wellbeing hat on that most of you know that I wear, consider their wellbeing. Um, check in on them, uh, make sure that they're kept updated, because if they don't end up being dismissed, they're coming back into your workplace. Um, so you need to make sure that you've looked after them while they're off. Okay, back over to Joe. So next up, you don't have to follow a fair process when dismissing an employee with less than two years service. What do we think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> cottoning on to the, the theme generally. Um, yeah, so absolutely right. So that is definitely false. Um, I think this comes from the general understanding that you only need, uh, you need two years <coughs> service um, to be protected by the unfair dismissal laws. But what most people um, on a day-to-day -day basis don't realise is that you don't need any length of service for things like a breach of contract claim, 
discrimination claims or automatic unfair dismissal claims. Um, and we hear this, we, we do hear this quite a lot from people. I don't want to name and shame anyone, but uh, there is quite a lot of calls we get where people will say, we've got this member of staff, um, performance is not there, um, or their attitude isn't very good, they keep turning up late. Um, so we just we just sack them, but it's fine, isn't it? I've got a problem because they don't have to use service, and um, we try and explain as politely as possible. <laughs> but actually, discrimination um, is is not limited to two years; it's a day one right, um, as is automatic unfair dismissal and breach of contract. So the key thing to remember with this is, uh, as a modern employer, I think the minimum standards expected of you now is. Um, to follow at least some semblance of a fair process. Um, and, and that really is the question. How do you prove a dismissal wasn't discriminatory? You've let this member of staff go in our little scenario, um, and you've got a perfectly fair reason, you really do, but you haven't documented any of the occasions where you've said to them, look, you know, you're coming in late. Look, you've got, uh, your standard of work isn't there. It's not good enough. Um, and you've, you've, you've dismissed them, and they bring a discrimination claim, and they say that the reason that they were dismissed was because of X protected characteristic. How do you prove then that actually it wasn't discriminatory, it had nothing to do with whatever their you know, gender or race or whatever was? In fact, it was because of the genuinely fair reason that you know, they, they, they weren't a very good member of staff, their, their conduct wasn't very good, or or well, there wasn't much work for them, so they really were just essentially redundant. Um, now, you don't have that issue if you've gone through a fair procedure, if you've met with them maybe after a few weeks, then again after a couple of months, you've kept a note, you've, you've documented the fact that you've told them, you know, these are the, the key performance indicators that we have for you, um, you know, you're not reaching these standards, what can we do to help you? Um, and then at the end of that perhaps six month period, you've sat them down, you've said, look, we're really sorry, things haven't got any better. We're gonna write to you and confirm that, you know, it's just not worked out. Um, if you then get that claim for discrimination, um, you can show perhaps the tribunal or, 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 or whatever, um, you can show them that you've followed that procedure, you've documented it, you've got that paper trail, basically. Um, and it's really about reducing risk, I think, overall, um, and, and protecting the business its, itself. So, yes, that's definitely a myth, I think. Right. Um, this is my last myth, um, and I fear the most complex of them all. Um, and in fact, Dan came into yesterday and said, oh, I find it really difficult to explain this to clients. And I was like, oh, that's fun, because that's what I'm doing tomorrow morning in the session. So, um, Myth number nine, employees who are off sick are not entitled to full pay during their notice period. True or false? <laughs> oh, it really work. The answer is, it depends. Um, and I'm going to try my hardest to explain this to you. It is notoriously complex. Um, it is an area of employment law that some employment lawyers, not us, um, don't know. Um, and are not familiar with because it is so complicated. There doesn't really seem to be any real reason for it either. Um, but bear with me and I'm going to walk you through it. Now the scenario we usually use is employee who's on long term sick, exhausted all their SSP, they're not being paid anything. <coughs> for one reason or another they resign or you look to dismiss them for, for, for their ill health. Um, and either party is giving notice, so either party is giving notice. What do you pay them for that notice period? And the answer is that it depends on what is in the contract of employment in relation to the notice that you as the employer have to give. So I'm just going to walk you back through that. Regardless of who is giving the notice, whether it's the employee resigning or the employer firing, the pay that you have to pay the employee during that notice period is dependent on what notice you as the employer have to give in the contract of employment, okay? If the notice that you as the employer have to give the employee is at least a week or more, more than the statutory minimum, then you get a pat on the back and you get rewarded by not having to pay the employee at all during the notice period. 
if you are a big bad employer who only pays employees the statutory minimum notice, if you were going to do the dismissing, then you do have to pay them full pay for that notice period. Now you're all looking at me like really blankly. It's really complicated. We just wanted to cover it off. If you ever get any queries on this, just give us a call. <laughs> I think we'll, we'll end on a slightly easier yeah. one. <laughs> um, so, all employers, sorry, all employees are entitled to a statutory redundancy payment when they're made redundant. Uh, yeah, general consensus is probably it's a myth, and that is correct. It is a myth. Now, it's true that. In order to get a statutory redundancy payment, you must have two years' service. So just because you're being made redundant does not necessarily mean that you are going to get one. Um, I think this comes perhaps from the, the notion that the longer you're at an employer, <coughs> or the longer you've been employed, the more redundancy pay you're entitled to. But it doesn't necessarily follow then that you get one no matter what. So um, there are actually other exclusions as well um, that, that mean you could lose it. So if you unreasonably refuse an offer of suitable alternative employment when you've been made redundant, don't necessarily get such a true redundancy payment. Um, if you have been given notice of redundancy and you leave before the end, you also forfeit it. Um, and slightly more rare cases, but dismissal for gross misconduct. If you are made redundant and you're given notice of termination and before you are essentially dismissed, um, you commit gross misconduct, you can lose the right to it. So, there you go. Myth busted. <laughs> Much more straightforward. Yes, <laughs> yes it's not <laughs> easy. Um, so that's it. Hopefully you found it relatively useful and interesting. Um, it just goes to show that there are lots, I think, of myths going around. Um, uh, so yeah, if you have any at the end, any myths you want to bust, me and Harry yeah. busting myths all morning. Um, <laughs> now we're up to Eddie. And now, family all myths, <laughs> before I start. Okay, so morning everyone. Um, big thank you to Harriet and to James for busting some myths in the world of employment law. For those of you who I haven't spoken to yet this morning, my name is Ellie Davies and I am a solicitor in the family team at Leeds Fryer. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here today as the guest speaker and I'm ready to bust some family law myths for you all. Now, I'm sure that you can all appreciate that when somebody is going through a divorce, it is a very distressing and sad time of their life. So from an employer's perspective, um, whilst you not, may not be necessarily going through a divorce yourself, some of your employees may be going through one now or might be going through one in the future. And so I hope that you can gain some basic information as to what they might be going through this morning. Now, I apologize in advance as some of these myths are particularly heavy, especially after listening to Harriet and James's <laughs> myths. However, I will try my hardest to keep things as lighthearted as possible for you all this morning. So with that in mind, turning to my first myth of the morning, which I hope is a relatively <coughs> easy one, but we'll see how it goes. Celebrities <coughs> that eat horses, do they exist and can anybody get one? So as we did with Harriet and James, Please put up a tick if you think it's yes or no if you think it's no. We do have a couple we do have a couple of ticks, so this one is in fact no, unfortunately. <laughs> so they don't exist and you can't get one even if we have any celebrities here today. So it is almost inevitable that when a celebrity couple announces that they are separating the media are then very quick to report that they have somehow obtained a quickie divorce. This kind of just suggests that they've been able to skip the process and deal with their affairs in a record time. This, however, is simply not true as there is a very specific set divorce timetable that people have to follow. So whether your name is Joe Bloggs or Tom Cruise, there is simply no way of avoiding this, unfortunately. <coughs> now, a number of you here today, I'm sure, will have seen that the new no-fault divorce laws are actually coming into effect next week. So this sees the biggest change in family law over the last 50 years. Um, so just to summarise, 
this will basically remove the blame game from the process um, and it is hoped that the divorce process will become a lot more amicable between the parties. So under this legislation, a party who wishes to commence the divorce must wait 20 weeks between the date of the application and the conditional order, which is otherwise known as the decree nisi under the current legislation, which is the penultimate stage of the divorce process, and a further six weeks between the conditional order and the final order, which formally ends the marriage. So all in all, this can take a total of 26 weeks. So unfortunately, a quick divorce is not really an option, unfortunately. So this timetable applies in almost all cases, um, but there are some very limited exceptions where the process can be sped up. For example, um, if you are terminally ill and you would like to get a divorce, or you would like to marry somebody who is terminally ill, then the process can be sped up in those instances. Disclaimer though, um, if the divorce is concluded, there may still be other negotiations going on in the background, such as arranging um, agreements for children and finances, which can take often months, if not years, to finalise. Mm -hmm. So all in all, a long process. So turning to my second myth of the morning. So a couple who are living together, but who are not married, are said to be cohabiting. So with that in mind, my second myth is do cohabiting couples have the same rights as married couples? What do you think to this one? <laughs> oh, some are not sure, so I can see some crosses and things. Okay, so I can see the majority are crosses. So this one is in fact, no, cohabiting couples do not have the same rights as married couples. I'm going to tell you why. So cohabiting couples are, what actually one, are actually the fastest growing family type in the UK, with over 3.5 million couples choosing to live together before or without getting married. Now, the law is very clear that cohabiting couples do not have the same rights as those who are legally married. So even if you've been living together for 50 years and you have 15 children together, this is still the case, unfortunately. <laughs> So, I'm sure that a number of you here today will have heard of the phrase common law marriage. Well, this is simply not a thing and hasn't actually existed in UK law since 1753. <laughs> <laughs> it is, in fact, a very popular myth that if you have been living together for a number of years, then you are said to be common law married. However, this is just not true, and the only way for a cohabiting couple to get the same rights as a legally married couple is by simply getting married. So some of the ways in which the rights can vary from a cohabiting couple to those who are married are shown on the slides. So um, the, ease of the ease of separation point is if you are cohabiting and you choose to separate, you simply can do so. Whereas if you are married and you would like to bring the marriage to an end, then unfortunately you have to go down the court process and obtain a formal order which brings the marriage to, the con to a conclusion. Um, as a cohabitee, you have no right to claim against your partner's assets, and there are a number of other differences. However, these are pretty complex, and I won't bore you with them this morning. <laughs> so, if you are living with somebody and you are not planning on getting married, then these issues can be overcome with some forward planning. So, the steps that you can take to protect yourself are, you could look at entering into a cohabitation agreement, which is an agreement um, that sets out how you would like your assets to be split when, when, and if you end up separating. <laughs> Hopefully you won't, but just, just in case, just in case. Um, if you are hoping to purchase a property with somebody else and you may be putting in different amounts towards the purchase price, you could look at entering into a declaration of trust which is registered against the title in accordance with how much each party put into the purchase price. And if you don't, hands up if you have a will here. Ooh, see, I see some people who haven't put their hands up. Um, if you don't have a will, then I would strongly recommend that you do get one, as that will just ensure that your assets are divided in accordance with your wishes. And we have a very friendly wills team um, at Queen's Prior. So if anybody would like one, do let me know. <coughs> oh. Just giving away the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was going to do that. Did anyone, did anyone see it? 
Okay, so my third myth, for those of you who might not have seen it, is all financial settlements are split 50-50. What do you reckon to this? <laughs> true or false? I knew I was going to do that, so I might as well just embrace it. So true or false? False. If anyone's having a tick up, like holding up a tick, it's not good. <laughs> Okay, so yes, you are right, well done everyone, this one is false. <laughs> so there is no set formula when it comes to dividing assets on divorce. Um, the starting point is 50-50 and equality, however, the court um, is always trying to achieve fairness when it comes to the division of assets on separation. Now, each case is very much decided upon its own facts, with judges having very wide discretion as to how they would like to deal with it. Um, one thing I always say to clients when advising them on their financial position is that you could put these facts in front of five different judges and the chances are that you will get five different outcomes. It really, really is that wide, unfortunately. So, the main consideration for a judge is always the needs of the children and making sure that those are met. Um, so basically making sure that they have somewhere to live following the separation. The other factors which are taken into consideration are the relative needs of the parties, the income and earning capacity of the parties, the standard of living, the age of the parties, as this can impact upon their ability to achieve financial independence moving forwards, and the duration of the marriage. So whilst equality and 50-50 is the starting point, often this can just be too much or too little, depending on the circumstances. Now, as I said at the beginning, it is all about what is fair, so, so that is the main criteria here. But I'll, try, I'll try not to give you the answer away for this one. In myth four, you can claim against each other financially in the future, even though you're divorced. Oh, got a bit of a mixed bag here. Okay. So, this one is in fact true. Yeah. If matters are not dealt with properly at the time of divorce. So, as I gained from your reaction, this one can often shock people, as um, many people think that if you are divorced, it means that your financial ties are cut too. So, it is not uncommon for many people to think that just because they have reached an agreement without the court's involvement, this is them having then settled their finances. However, this is simply not the case, and in order to protect yourself moving forwards, you have to have a consent order in place, which is a legally binding document, which has been approved by the court. So without a consent order in place, then it means that your claims against one another remain open, and so you are very vulnerable in the future. So to put this into context for you, if you win on the lottery or you inherit well in say 10 or even 20 years time then your ex-partner even though those assets may not have been available at the time that you got divorced without the protection of the consent order they can apply to the court to then claim a proportion of that money so that is it's very shocking um, which is why I always advise clients to commence the finances at the same time and address those, make sure you have a legally binding consent order in place um, whilst going through the divorce process so um, we avoid things like this happening in the future. So, I'm on to my last myth of the morning, which relates to prenuptial agreements. So, for those of you who may not know what a prenuptial agreement is, it is an agreement that parties enter into before they get married um, and it sets out how they would like their assets to be split if they unfortunately get divorced in the future. So with that in mind, um, my final myth of the morning is prenuptial agreements are always legally binding. Ooh. Yeah, you're, you're, made, you're good, you are good, okay. So this one is false. Prenuptial agreements are not <coughs> automatically legally binding. Now, prenuptial agreements can work really, really well um, as long as the criteria, as shown on the board, um, are taken into consideration when the prenup is prepared. So the prenup has to have financial disclosure attached to it, which sets out both parties' respective financial positions at the time of entering into the agreement. Neither party can be pressured to enter into the agreement. So 
this means that it has to be prepared and signed in advance of the wedding. So it can't just be presented on the evening of the wedding, and it must be presented when three weeks is generally considered the absolute minimum. Both parties must have had independent legal advice on the terms of the agreement, and they both must show a common intention to be bound by the agreement. Now, the biggest um, criteria element is fairness. The terms of the agreement must be fair in having regard to all of the circumstances. So to put this into context, um, it wouldn't be fair if one party were to keep their multi-millions of pounds, their investments, their properties, etc., if the other party was, ne was left with absolutely nothing. So, that, those are my myths this morning. Um, that's all from me. Thank you all so much for listening. If you've got any questions, um, I understand we are doing a question and answer session at the end, or grab me afterwards, or connect with me on LinkedIn. But for now, I will hand you over to the main man, Dan Chapman, to deliver his legal update. I need an appointment with you this afternoon, Ellie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if any of you used to be married to someone who won the lottery, I suggest you also go and see it. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. <laughs> Returning, I'm afraid, to the uh, mundane world of, of employment law, I'm just going to do a quick update. Um, two cases I just wanted to bring to your attention, um, and then we'll move in, into questions. Um, this was quite an interesting case recently. Um, Shell was a contractor working at Tarmac, quite, quite, quite a well-known company nationally, and um, he was on site as a contractor working alongside Tarmac's own employees, and there was a bit of tension between the contractors um, and the Tarmac employees, according to the, the facts of the judgment, and a particular employee at Tarmac um, put essentially, they're like bullets, pellet targets they're called, um, on a bench behind him as a bit of a prank um, and hit them with a hammer and they sort of explode and you think you're being shot and it makes a really loud noise. Um, but it actually caused Mr Chell significant problems with his hearing. He had a, a serious ear injury. Now, um, the response of Tarmac was, as you would expect, to fire Mr Heath, the employee um, that had carried out this prank. They, they did not in any way endorse it and, and certainly can't be criticised for their reaction to the incident. Um, but Mr Chell, the contractor, um, wanted to sue Tarmac. Obviously they've got far deeper pockets than if he was to try and sue um, Mr Heath, because Mr Heath is now an unemployed <laughs> individual. Um, and to cut a very long story short, um, the courts held that Tarmac were not liable that um, the acts of their rogue employee um, were not their responsibility. They could not have reasonably foreseen that one of their employees would do something so, so ridiculous. And one of the um, key factors that, that the court settled upon is that whilst Mr Chell said that Tarmac should have been aware that there was tension between the contractors and the Tarmac employees, and therefore they should have done more um, to protect the contractors from this sort of behaviour. Um, the courts held there was no actual evidence that Tarmac were aware of any of these tensions, um, and there's no reason that they could have expected that something like this would happen. And I think it's just quite a helpful um, judgment, because there have been lots of cases over the last few years that have gone the other way, have been reported to go the other way, and it's made employers extremely nervous. But the key takeaway from this is that Tarmac did react properly by firing the individual. Had they not have um, fired him, I think one, one might find them in a, in, a, in a very different position. It was the response to the incident, but also the fact that they had proper procedures in place, proper training, um, they had done everything they reasonably could, and it wouldn't be fair that they were responsible for a rogue employee carrying out his prankless task. Banter. We love a bit of banter. <laughs> so, Barclays Bank, sorry if there's any gone from Barclays Bank here, I don't think there are anything on banks here, but um, you know, this is in the public domain, and um, Barclays got themselves <coughs> a bit of bother um, because one of their senior man managers um, had a habit of referring to the women in his branch as birds. <laughs> um, and he said that that was something he always did, 
um, and that actually this particular claimant, um, he'd only called her a bird on two or three occasions. Um, <laughs> and that it was a affectionate or ironic term um, and was all part of the culture of banter in, in the workplace. Um, the tribunal has held um, that that amounted to direct discrimination. Um, they accepted that this individual was offended by the use of the word um, and was entitled to, to expect that language of that nature would not be used. And the tribunal didn't accept that the fact it may have been said in an ironic um, manner, which was the, the case of the Barclays book, um, they didn't accept that was sufficient. Um, what we don't know yet is what compensation will arise from that injury to feelings and that discrimination. And this is quite a recent case, um, and it, it, it's soon to go to a remedy hearing. I suspect it may well settle. Um, but I thought it's a very useful reminder that in 2022, um, language in the workplace that might well have been acceptable um, in legal terms, certainly, um, in years gone by, probably no longer is. And the law on discrimination is ever evolving, and it's very, very clear um, that the days of being able to rely on workplace banter as a defence are probably gone. Um, hence the, the real importance for training, um, training for your managers, training for your senior people, so that they're aware of these types of issues because actually there was no suggestion, and, and I think even the, the courts accepted it, there was no suggestion that this particular manager was a, an unpleasant individual. He was genuinely quite, I think, mortified to understand that this was discrimination. He had just come through the system um, and thought this was okay. And, and the importance, therefore, of training so that you as a business don't find yourself not just getting sued and all the costs that go that, but the reputational damage caused um, by such a thing can, can be significant. Because here I am, Barclays bashing, completely <laughs> un unwarranted. Um, there we go. So don't do it. No birds in the workplace, please. <laughs> so I had to talk about PO. <laughs> PO are the archetypal example of a modern. <laughs> I mean, they fire people on Zoom. You, you can't get more modern than that. <laughs> it, 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 it did remind me of, of um, how technology has moved on. When 20 odd years ago I dealt with a case um, which also made the public domain more like the Great Yarn of Mercury, though, rather than <laughs> <laughs> the sort of papers that the PO made. But, but my particular client in that instance had a scenario where they, they needed to fire 150 people quickly that day. Um, and of course there was no, no Zoom or um, they didn't even have the mobile numbers of their employees. They had no way to coordinate it. So we came up with, an, I'm, I'm almost ashamed to tell you the story, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> um, we came up with a really cunning plan, which was to set the fire alarm off in the factory so they all went outside into the car park locksmiths on hand to change the locks <laughs> and then the MD got up with his megaphone and had to fire everyone in the car park and it was the only way he could collectively get everybody together. Um, and I, I, tell, I tell that story for a reason because you're all shocked and, and, and mortified to hear that. Um, but there was absolutely compelling reasons why they had to do it. They had lost their biggest customer the day before who provided about 85% of their, their revenue. Um, they employed 800 or so people across various parts of the country, but in this particular branch, they just had no work. And if they didn't take quick action in that particular area, the whole company would have unravelled with, within weeks. So they had to take very urgent action, and they had no other means in, 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 in the era that they were in of, of communicating to people in the way that they did. And what struck me when the P&O um, Ferry's case broke, I don't, I don't know if... Um, others felt this, but when I first heard it, I thought, we're not getting the full story here. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't believe that p Terry's had just gone on to Zoom, fired everyone, ignored their employment law obligations without any advice, and surely they've got, got, got good lawyers, and they must have a plan here. And I was sort of str struggling to understand in many ways um, what, what was really behind this, and I've, I've read a lot of it, I found it you know, as an employment lawyer, fascinating. Um, and I think that 
it's another good example of, of the facts that the media don't always report the full story. And I'm not suggesting for one moment that the way in which they dealt with it um, was in any way consistent with being a modern employer. It, 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 it was clearly brutal. Um, however, it, it, it demonstrates one of the difficulties of having a large workforce that are represented, whether it's represented by a trade union or represented by employee representatives, because there's lots of criticism of PO that they didn't consult with people and that it was just, you know, the first these employees knew about it was when they were fired on Zoom. Well, PO's obligations were to consult with the trade union because that was the way in which the workforce was structured. Um, and they'd been meeting with the trade union almost daily for the last two years. So it's not true to say that it came as a shock to the trade union. The trade union were warned frequently that if we can't come to an agreement about working practices going forwards, we're going to have to do something. The trade union might not pass that message on to those 800 people, and there's a far bigger piece here, which I'm not going to go into to, to, to today, about why this has happened. Um, it's also a particularly nerdy case, because as I'm sure you've read, um, p and ferries actually were able to avoid the usual obligation you have, which is to notify an event of mass redundancies. You have to notify the government on this thing called an HR1 form. Um, didn't apply to them because their ship is the workplace and it's not considered to be domiciled in the United Kingdom. Their ships are either based in Bermuda or Cyprus. So the obligation to report redundancies in a UK workplace didn't arise. So they didn't have to do that. And then there's also an issue that they don't have to pay minimum wage because minimum wage again applies in UK workplaces and there's this really sort of weird maritime law uh, but out in the sea, you don't you don't have to pay minimum wage, um, and so what P and O coming after COVID have been saying to the unions is the shift patterns in place, the pay that we have to pay, um, we can't make work. Now none of us have seen the numbers, and we don't know if this is opportunism on their part or more akin to the story I told you about my client that genuinely would have gone into liquidation if they hadn't have taken that that action. So we don't know whether they're overplaying their their financial plight. Um, but the reality is they've made a judgment call um, and there's lots of talk about what they've done is illegal. Um, but it's always a reminder that employment law is, is fundamentally civil. And so when people talk about things being illegal, we're not talking about criminality. There is usually a financial option. And it's true that if you don't consult with employees in large dismissals, you have to pay 13 weeks compensation for that failure to consult. That's the law, and P&O have offered everybody more than that. So they've bought their way out of their employment law obligations, having priced that in going forwards, because they've obviously done the maths and worked out they're, 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 they're far better um, all over. But please don't go home or go to work and, and, and fire everyone on Zoom. <laughs> that's, not, that's not cool. <laughs> Questions on... Anything employment law related, if you have a family question now, we'll do it. We'll do a few questions here whilst everyone's here. If anybody needs to, to duck off out then, then they can do. But but then we'll also go back upstairs. Um, but let's let's just see any immediate questions. Anything? Um, hi. Um, it's about returning to the office um, from being working at home for two years and, and the office are now requiring people to come back and they very generous in saying we have a hybrid yeah. working. We're asking you to come in at least one day a week. Yes. Um, an employee says that they are not able to do that because of um, a medical condition that they were right. able to work previously in the office. Yeah. Um, gone down the route of an occupational health. Yeah. Phase return is suggested by the occupational health and the employee still refuses. Okay, well, it's a reasonable management instruction that they return. Mm -hmm. um, the current position, and indeed from tomorrow, even more so, whether or not one agrees with it, the government position as of tomorrow is that COVID is no different to a flu or a cold. And mm -hmm. um, two years ago, you wouldn't have been asking me the question, we've got an employee who refuses to come into the office because they might get the flu. Mm -hmm. Nobody would ever ask that question. And that's where we are as of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So you, you've gone through that fair and reasonable process with our modern employer hat on, you sit down with that employee if you haven't already and really try and understand what their worries are, 
Is there anything we can do to, to assure them? But fundamentally, you get to the point where you have to say, it is a reasonable management instruction. We're satisfied it's reasonable. And from Monday the so-and-so day, this is happening. And they will either back down and comply, or they won't. And if they don't, you'll be in gross misconduct then. Any other? Adjourn upstairs because um, I appreciate often people like to ask us more private questions. Um, just before we do so, if I could ask you to fill in the, the feedback forms, that would be really helpful. There's also some um, a flyer in there about our, our training. A lot of um, what we've talked about today um, is really a neat lead into the fact that um, a lot of your managers, a lot of your people that deal with these kind of issues may well benefit from training. Um, we offer all sorts of bespoke training courses, and there's some details of that in the pack, and if you want to have a <coughs> chat with us about those, we would be um, delighted. Um, final present to you for coming out here is that we will um, pay your car parking if you parked at the forum. Um, you just need to go to customer services and they'll stamp that, and, 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 and that's on us if you did park in the forum. Um, and if you'd like to join us for coffee upstairs, that'd be wonderful. If not, have a great day and I hope to see you at our next seminar. Thank you all.